Hello, I'm Jason Hunter, Principal Solution Architect with DynamoDB. What uh, we have here is a recording I made last week in front of a live studio audience of about 100 attendees. And I thought, you know, maybe this would be worth putting on YouTube so that more people interested in DynamoDB and this topic of kind of learning about DynamoDB through puzzlers might get a chance to enjoy it. So here it is on YouTube. All right, so welcome to today's deep dive on DynamoDB with puzzlers. I'm real excited about this talk because uh, I did this at reInvent last December and it was interactive and it was a lot of fun. It's a way to learn DynamoDB without it being like, here's a feature. I'm going to present you with situations like how would you solve this? Why would this happen? And the goal is to use your understanding of DynamoDB features to kind of maybe answer that question. And hopefully some of you will have answers that I haven't even thought of about how to solve a problem or, or how something's doing. Uh, we are using Chime for this as opposed to an official uh, like uh, webinar thing. So it's a little bit more interactive. We have a chat window on the side where we're going to do answers. With so many people, we're at 70 plus. Uh, we probably shouldn't be on video. Let's not do uh, audio because I think 70 people talking at the same time might be rough. We'll find out. But the idea is that I'm going to maybe uh, pose a puzzle to you and you're going to say, all right, I got an idea and you can type it in and I'll see what the, the responses are and interact with those. If you have a question as we go along, uh, put it in there. And if it's something that's kind of a general applicability, I'll answer it. If it's something that's maybe specific to you, uh, make sure that we have your name there and we can then follow up with you uh, after this whole thing. Does that all make sense? Any questions? This is your first chance to go into chat and say if there's a question. No questions. All right. You all know where the chat is. Uh, I'm going to stop my video here and get started on, on going through here. So what I'm going to talk about today is first a set of little puzzles. I'm calling them amuse-bouche. You know when you go to a restaurant and they give you a little taste just to get you warmed up? That's what this is. A couple little quick puzzlers to help you be like, oh, I get the idea of how this talk goes. How would that be? What would this be caused by? And then I'll go through two schema design challenges that have a lot of interesting implications. First, we're going to vend redemption codes. Like if you uh, screw the top off a Pepsi bottle, you know, and you got a code underneath, let's say we're going to be printing those and have to go to some service and vend those. And another one is to look up metadata about IP addresses at scale. I think I have a good answer for each of these puzzles, but, you know, feel free to top me. When I did this uh, in person, people were coming up with thoughts I hadn't thought of, and that's really the most fun of this, I think. So, all right, are we ready? I'm gonna assume uh, I see nodding heads out there. Here's your first one. Real, real question you get sometimes. My on-demand table is very slow to load some initial data. I had to switch to provisioned and it loaded much faster. What's going on? And uh, type your answers in the chime chat there. If you have an idea, what would be causing this? Cold start versus warm start. All right, what, is, what does that mean? What's a cold start of on-demand table? And uh, Martin says on-demand needs to scale up versus already there. All right, maybe let's try doing a little bit of sound. Martin, do you wanna come off mute and give an answer? You sort of have a- um, Sure. Like audience, hey Martin. Um, yeah, on demand is on demand. So it's like kind of sitting there at like some very low provisioned threshold. So when you request it, it needs an opportunity. It needs time to like spin up and actually serve your request depending on how much it is versus provisioned is already running at that capacity all the time. So it's ready for whatever you have it provisioned for. Yeah, very good. So the idea of an on demand table is that it, it has some capabilities on creation. And there's a decision of, well, it should it be like this giant capable table or a more medium capable table. And if you look at the docs, it says that we assume that this table, well, let's start this. An on-demand table tries to be very responsive in, based on what it sees as traffic coming to it. It always tries to be able to handle double a previous peak. So if you've written at a certain X amount, it should be ready to write 2X. If you've read at Y amount, it should be able to uh, read it 2Y. But when it's created, what's X and Y? What's, what's the base? So what it does is it assumes that you have, say, 2,000 as a high water mark for writes. So therefore, you should be able to write at 4,000. And uh, 
6,000 read units uh, on the start. So it assumes you should be able to do 12,000, right? Well, that's a pretty good size table, but it might not be the traffic that you send. Maybe you're an enterprise customer. You know that you're going to be sending 50,000, 100,000. If you provision the table at 50 or 100,000, the table is ready to go at that level. An on-demand table takes a little bit of time to get there. All right. So that's what's going on. So someone, I think, wrongly here assumed that a provision table is more capable than an on-demand table. Actually, an on-demand table is extremely responsive, always trying to adapt uh, to respond immediately to the traffic that you're sending. And that's why it keeps that 2x buffer of any previous high watermark. But on the first minute that table exists, you know, the high watermark is just a standard size. So what do you do about it? Uh, one thing you can do is you can provision the table at the level you need and then switch to on-demand mode. And that way this on-demand table, even though it's new, has been pre-warmed and the table's ready to handle the traffic that you're going to be sending. So you don't want to do excessive amounts of read or write capacity because you don't have a table that's uh, too large, that's inefficient for later access. But if you know that you're going to get a certain amount of uh, traffic, this is a good way to have a, a hot on-demand table. And I see sometimes people every day at midnight, maybe they make a new on-demand table. I see some throttles for the first 30 minutes while they're sending more traffic than that on-demand table was created to handle. And as it expands out, it doubles up. Make sense? All right. I'm looking at a table with lots of write traffic, but zero read traffic. Why would anyone have a table that they never read from? Here's your puzzle. Because you know what? If, uh, if you're not going to read from a database, Dev Null is a very affordable and scalable database. All right, Steve says audit logs. Varun says streams. David agrees. Adam says logs. All right, Steve, uh, do you want to pipe in on what audit logs would be? Yeah, um, I've used a table before where we just captured a lot of like change tracking events and we wanted to store those. Mm -hmm. But we didn't necessarily mm -hmm. ever have like a use case, like a regular use case for reading that data. So it's not that we would never read it. It's just like on a typical day, we might not read it. It would only be in the case of we had an issue or an audit or something we would come back to read from that table. Gotcha. I like that. Yeah, so it's kind of uh, maybe maybe later on. Maybe you, I looked for one day and I didn't see any reads, but that's important data for later. Something like that. Uh, Varun says streams. You want to say what streams are about, Varun? Basically, uh, a consumer is consuming the change data capture data through DynamoDB streams instead of directly reading from the table. Yeah, I like that one too. So the idea there is that uh, when you change data in a table, you can watch those mutation events, DynamoDB streams or Kinesis, and maybe the write is just the first step in a process that's triggered by that stream. So maybe you have a Lambda going to process that data for some downstream consumption, store it, uh, but maybe do something else. There's a couple other use cases as well. In fact, I think what the customer was doing uh, here, people haven't thought of yet. One one that uh, I don't think is what they were doing, but uh, is an interesting use case. They were doing an item potency check. Uh, you could be doing an item potency check, which is I'm going to insert into the table a marker that something happened with the idea that I want to know if maybe my write failed because it already existed, in which case I could make a decision like, oh, that already happened? All right, never mind. So you don't need to do a read so much as the act of writing while checking for existence and erring out if it already existed. It's kind of an implicit read, right? And that's that's good. I've seen that used uh, by some people who wanted to uh, make sure that they only execute anything once. So they create a table of all the like hashes of actions and you put in there like, I'm going to do this. Is that good? And it writes if you're the first one and it fails if you're the second one. A lock table with TTL. Hmm. A That's lock table kind of with what TTL. You're describing. I used a Dynamo table oh, yeah, yeah. a locking basis with the TTL so they would expire. But if mm. we were able to write mm. successfully, then we knew you know, we could we acquired the lock. But if the attempt to write failed, then we knew it was uh lock was already held by someone else. Gotcha. Yeah, that's yeah, same idea. You know what I think the the real customer was doing here? was uh, it was a session store. And so they were basically going there and, and doing an update of the timestamp and they were reading back the values that were already stored. Something in that realm. Because if you do it right, you can ask for return values of all the old, old values at the time of the write, which means that your write has this implicit read of what was there before. 
And so you can manage some sort of session state by saying, hey, here's my new values, insert this, insert the new time. And by the way, tell me what was there before. And so that way they could do a read even while uh, they were only doing writes. But I do remember when I first saw a table that had only write traffic, I thought, well, I know how to save some money on this one. <laughs> Let's delete the table. <laughs> Not recommended. All right. Let's uh Let's look at a puzzle here, ending redemption codes. So here's here's a, a real issue that uh, someone called me up and, and was like looking for advice on. So they wanted to vend unique redemption codes as a service. So picture you're gonna write this uh, vending as a service fast. You have a partition key, which would be each marketing campaign. I think that's a pretty good design. And the sort key would be the codes as some sort of random alphanumeric, like the thing that gets printed on the Pepsi uh, screw top. You might have thousands of unique partition keys and a million unique sort keys. You want to efficiently pull a code for a campaign, after which we'll use it and then burn it from the table so it's never vended again. Remember, thousands of partition key values, each of which would have thousands or, or more uh, codes as the sort key. This is an interesting puzzle. I, th I thought this one had a fun set of designs. So how would you do this? Uh, first, let's say I give you an item. How do I get it and delete it safely? If we were in person, I'd be looking at Steve like, <laughs> come on, Steve, you got this. Transactions. Yeah, transactions. All right, so what do we do with transactions? You'd, hmm, transactions. You can read items. Transactions lets you write a set of items acid. So with a transaction, you can say, I want to update, like, say, three items, and they either all have to write or none of them write. But here I'm only doing a single item. So in a sense, with DynamoDB, every time you do a single item, you kind of have this implicit transaction around it because uh, we serialize all access to individual items. So transactions don't really help a whole lot. Can you delete while returning the old value back? Hmm. Issue a delete for it. Get the old value back. So you have to get the primary key. You have to ask for a delete while getting the old value back. But then basically you, you try to do a delete and see if you are going to uh, succeed or fail on the delete, right? So get it. And then try to do a delete. And if you can't do the delete, then you uh, know that you have, I didn't actually get it. Like you you're, you read it to think it's yours, then you try to delete it to mark it as yours. And if you succeed on the delete, it was yours. And if you don't succeed on the delete, then it wasn't yours. And you know, like someone else deleted it right ahead of you. At a timestamp, date time stamp to the record of when it was used. Yeah, uh, Cody's saying that one. Deleting uh, the data means you cannot ensure uniqueness. It is a challenge we're going to face on how do we keep the burn log of what did we do? Uh, yep, don't code conditionals, which is good. I like I like when you say conditionals because here's my hint. <laughs> it's an air conditioner. <laughs> That's where I'm I'm sending you down the conditional path. Can I just skip the get and return run a delete? with return values of all old. Well, the problem is to do a delete, you have to get the primary key of the item. So you have to know the item first. Basically, you have to at least have to do a get. Somehow, well, you, don't, you can't do a get because you don't know the SK. You don't know the sort key. So somehow you have to figure out what the sort key is so you can get the primary key so you can do the delete, right? And so uh, here, really, what's the best way to pick an item to burn? Let's let's Before we even think about how do we burn an item, how do I get a good item? I have the campaign, I have the partition key, but I don't have a sort key. So what do I do? What the person I was talking to was doing, they were just gonna get the first one. Do we see any problems with that? If I just get the first one, what's gonna be our our experience on, on always getting the first one in the item collection? <clears throat> yep, that's a story that's ripe for contention. Lots of readers all get the same item. So the challenge is if you get the first, everyone at the same time will be getting the same item. 
and you can do a safe delete or something where you say like, hey, delete it and let me know if I didn't get the delete or you could update it in some fashion. But if 10 threads all get the same item, you're going to have very low throughput. And so that's not great. So what else could you do? What could you do that's simple? The next thing that we talked about was, uh, what about pulling the first N items? All right, I'll, I'll get 10 and I'll pick one of the first 10. Or, ten, or 100? How many should I pull? There's, there's a good question. What should N be? To pick the right N actually requires a lot of understanding of DynamoDB. I'm gonna pull the first N items and select a random one as mine, and then I will try to burn it by like deleting it. What's N? Who reads that you don't need drives cost up? Yeah, well, that's true too. You'll be, all that contention cause, causes money besides latency. But what should N be? That's the question to the floor. We assume that the sort key is say, I don't know, 10 bytes. We assume that the partition key is 10 bytes. So my item size is about 20 bytes. What should N be? Well, how does DynamoDB do read costing? If you do a query, for a certain partition key and you say, give me some set of items, like the first n many, how does it get uh, priced? It is based on 4K chunks, right? If you read one item or if you read 10 items, so long as they all fit within 4KB, you're going to be paying that one read unit or half read unit if it's eventually consistent. So I could basically read the first item or the first 10 items at the same cost and about the same efficiency, so long as the set of items was less than 4KB. So if each item is 20 bytes, I could read 100 and it'd be about 2000, right? So 100 is not so bad, maybe 150, almost up to 200 and still feel comfortable it'll be under 4KB. And that'll cost me that one read unit strongly consistent, half a read unit eventually consistent. And I can then pick one of that first thousand to delete. And I'll be in, actually, I was doing it wrong, 100, right? Someone in the back is doing like, Jason, you're doing bad math there. But if I did 100 times 20 bytes, that's 2000. So I'm well underneath the 4KB. So I can pull the first 100 and burn one at random. And I haven't increased my read cost any. That's kind of cool once you understand how the read units work. So that's pretty good. It's, I mean, it's, it offends a certain amount of my style. Like I feel like I should get a random one, but all right, read the first 100. It fits under 4KB, burn one at random. If I have 100 threads, I'm still going to have very little contention, probably good. But let's say I'm a perfectionist and I really want to get a true random code from a specific campaign. How do I do that? Generate a few random characters as the sort key. All right. Why would that work, Steve? You want to come off mute and... Yeah, um, I mean, you don't know what the claim codes are, but if you say, I want to start searching from, like, let's just say, like a, like from letter M, right, then you're going to pick a random letter. So you could have at least, if you had 26 different clients, now pick a random letter. Theoretically, they're jumping into different parts, different random parts into the tree. Um, and if you do exactly. enough characters, you get to a higher level of randomness. Yeah, it's kind of like going to the dictionary and picking a random word, not by necessarily going to a random page, but picking a random prefix for a word. And the prefix doesn't have to exist. You can say, give me the next word after three randomly generated characters, and you'll have a pretty good chance of finding a random word. Now in a dictionary, since letters aren't evenly distributed, it's not quite perfect. But here we assume that the sort keys are actually random. And so picking a random prefix should work pretty well. Uh, but what gives you assurance that a sort key exists with any random prefix of characters? That's Gavin's question. That's what's cool though, is if you do a query and you say starts with this, well, not starts with, but uh, uh, starting here, greater than this, basically, going forward, give me one, you will get a random one. So it's kind of like, uh, if you think of a thousand numbers and I pick a random uh, number and say, give me the number that you're thinking of higher than this, I can get one of your numbers at random. Uh, to do it right, I have to do greater than or less than as a second call. If I get nothing greater than, I have to say, oh, maybe it's less, because when it starts to get pretty empty, you're going to uh, maybe not find anything higher than, maybe you'll have to go lower than, something like that. But you do a query like that, you say higher than this random prefix, it should work. 
Does that effectively limit clients? Assuming alphanumeric, there's a hard cap at 36 consumers, but that's not an artificial limit. If auto scaling, what do I, how do I distribute? Right, and Steve says multiple characters. So uh, the, the real interesting question there is how many characters would I do? Every time you do one, if it's alphanumeric, uppercase, lowercase, that's uh, what, uh, 26 times two, 52 plus 10, 62. So you get 62. So if I do three characters, that's 62 cubed different potential starting points. And I just pick that and I say, that's plenty. And I say, give me the value above this three character random prefix and I will get kind of a random sort key. So that's kind of overkill because I think getting the first hundred items would have worked just fine. But from a style point of view, I kind of like getting a, a true random. All right. So we had a need to keep a record of burned codes. So we want to keep track, like, all right, I, I not just delete it. Deleting got rid of it, but maybe I want to keep a record because, you know, they always give you requirements to make things hard. So what's the right way to do that? We have a few choices. Date time stamp. So Cody wants a date time stamp in there. Uh, do you want to explain, Cody? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, this this is a typical pattern used in in uh, soft deleting anywhere, anywhere but mm -hmm. uh, by applying a, a date timestamp of when something is unavailable, uh, you can just check for non-null uh, quickly uh, for that uh, for that field, uh, and then you know when uh, when the data you, you know the data is not there. But then you also have auditing of when it was used if you need to grab that for analytics later. I agree. The challenge with this is it makes it harder to select the next random one because as time goes on, more and more of my items will be deleted. And I can't really do an efficient deleted lookup with this sort key design, right? I can pull sure. the first hundred, but maybe 90 of them are deleted. Uh, so I have to put a deleted flag in the sort key. No, I don't wanna do that because you can't change it. You can't change a sort key on an item. You have to delete and insert another one. That's not, that's the downside of the timestamp. It's kind of a classic, uh, but when you have to do the select, it makes the select harder. Uh, Denko says Dynamo streams could work. Do you want to say what how that would work? What are you going to do with yeah. it after the stream? Yeah, I think everybody was suggesting options on that, but basically what I thought is um, you just keep track of the deleted items somewhere else. And well, I don't know what you're going to use them for because it's like keeping mm -hmm. a record of burned codes. But once you have them somewhere else, maybe in a different table, like someone suggested, you can you can know if they were used or not. Right on. So, uh, yeah, so the idea of streams is that every time I do a delete, I can get a, an event and I can put into another table so I could delete it. I could watch the deletes and I could insert into an audit table using some sort of trigger. So that's nice. It gets it out of the critical path of the right. It's and it lets me put it into probably an audit table is the easiest because I kind of want it out of my main table because then it it hurts my finding of the next code. So if I put it into another table, it doesn't hurt my future queries. Uh, da, 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 other ones move to a different PK at the same time. Yeah, that could kind of work. But the challenge there is that's basically a delete and insert. Uh, so it, moving a PK is two rights and kind of a nuisance for you, as opposed to maybe watching the stream and putting into a second table. Uh, Matthew says, put under a second table of the timestamp, hard delete and done, be stream to consume, choose a winner from the downstream audit table. Uh, yeah. Mm. Ah. Must I use transact right items? No one said transactions on this one. We went straight to streams, which I, my idea on this one was that people would have said transact right items and I was going to suggest streams, but you thought of streams. So instead of streams, you could do a transact right items where you delete in the base table, the main table, and you insert into an audit table as a two-step process, doing it that way to make sure that you don't miss a code. You don't want to do like a delete and insert as two separate processes because you want to make sure that you never do a delete and then say crash your client app and fail to do the second right. So transact right items is another one. Now the streams is better. I think because the streams is going to be one right to the uh, main table and then catch the stream and then one right to the audit table. So for a total cost of two rights, whereas transact right items would be two rights, but times two for the transactions that would cost four rights. 
and also increases the uh, the effort a little bit on the on the right. Doesn't matter, but you know what? We're we're going for perfection here. We're not going for good enough. Uh, I think the streams is a superior approach to transact right items myself. If anyone disagrees, say something in the Slack and argue the other side. You might be right. Here's my hint on streams. Haha, <laughs> y'all were ahead of me. All right. What table class would be best for the audit table? Ah, uh, hey, this is Alexandra. Yeah, so you know, we we introduced this new infrequent access table class, which has a lower cost for storage, uh, sixty percent lower cost of storage, so significant discount, but a twenty five percent uplift on read and write costs. So that's a great choice for a table like the audit table, which is going to be very rarely written, almost never read, rarely written, but is going to store a lot of data. Although what I think is kind of interesting is maybe not day one, right? Day one, when it's empty, and you'd want to be in standard mode because you have almost no storage cost. <clears throat> but over time, the table will grow. The read and write rate will stay presumably about flat but the storage grows, it's never ending. So there will be some cutover point where you wanna go IA. The cutover point is actually when storage is more than 42% of the throughput cost. And that's just mathematical based on the 60% discount on the storage cost and the 25% uplift on the read write cost. So there's a good way for a standard A to come into the picture. Would this work with global tables? <clears throat> Right, global tables, automatic replication, active active across regions. Could I do this design with global tables? I have stumped the audience. <clears throat> the answer is kind of, but be careful. The idea of global tables being active-active uh, is, let's say we were doing all of our writes in one region, then we'd have another uh, region that's very close to consistent with the, the first table, usually less than a second replication lag. And should there be some issue with uh, my stack in region A, I could start sending users to region B and they would have a very close to up-to-date view. Uh, if they could wait a little bit longer, they'd have a completely up-to-date view. But what you want to not do is concurrent writes to both regions, because if I do that, I might burn the same code at the same time in both regions, and then they'd replicate. It's a last write or wins replication. If I do a double delete, that's fine. It will stay deleted, but I will have twice thought that I was the unique burner of this code, and that code would be double vended. So this is a situation where you'd want to do routing to one table, at least one replica region per partition key. So maybe I'll do PK123 to west and PK456 to east, that's all right. But I don't wanna be ever trying to bend the same set of codes from two regions because that conditional on the delete to make sure that it was actually mine, I can't ensure that because maybe the other region would take the right. So that's something to remember with global tables. Great stuff, but have to think about it. All right, we'll pause there for me to catch my breath. And we'll do our last puzzle. The idea here is we want to look up IP addresses. This is another real customer example that came to me. They have metadata about IPv4 addresses, you know, typical IP addresses that we see out there in the world. For every range of IP addresses, they know the owner, country of origin, security rules to apply, things like that. And they want to say, I have 500,000 of these ranges. I'm going to give you an IP address you look at the start and end ranges to find the, the range that contains my IP address and tell me the metadata about it, okay? So IP address comes in, range lookup happens, 500,000 ranges approximately, and return the metadata for the range that contains that IP address. How do I data model this? And how fast can I actually do those queries? The idea is I wanna do these queries as fast as possible. Anyone wanna? Write something in if you want to take a stab at uh, at doing the design here. This is this is a bravery test. 
Order the ranges to start, says Matthew. I like that. That's definitely going to help. So, but but I have two. What do I do about that, Matthew? I got to start, end, and end, and I only have one sort key. How do I do a, a between, uh, uh, like, you know, I have one sort key to play with. I'll start going here first. Like, what's the algorithm I would do? Hmm. And to, to simplify things, I will say, let's assume we have a continuous non-overlapping ranges um, because if the ranges overlap it's kind of a problem anyway because there's only should be one metadata set for any ip address and if there is a range where i do not have data i can put in a marker that says no data here all right so given that now i think i've got an idea of how to do a sort key would use uh, stitch start and end together to make a compound key I don't think you need that, Adam, because I really only need the start. My mental vision of this is imagine you have a set of fence posts going down the road, and on each fence post is metadata about the range of the fence from that fence post to the next fence post. If you give me a distance down this road, I just go down the road that much distance, and I look to the post that I just passed, and that's the metadata for the portion of the fence that I'm at. I don't really need the end one because the end one is implicitly the next start one because it's contiguous non-overlapping. So I can do it with a simple sort key by saying, you know, find me the metadata where uh, the sort key is, basically where the IP address is greater than the sort key, find me the first one. And now I've got that. Uh, so I can do that with a single query. What data type do I use for the sort key though? I have IP addresses like 1.2.3.4. Anyone want to take a stab at what you would do for a sort key data type? Got to be sortable. Ah, Steve's throwing out zero padding, zero 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 dot zero zero zero, etc. Uh, Gavin wants IPs and integers. Cody wants a hex representation of IPv4. Oh, easier to scan, less string parsing. These are all perfect answers. Any one of them will work. Uh, and what what value do we pick for the partition key? By the way, the zero padding works because uh, even though they're numbers, you if you zero pad to three digits, they will sort like strings. So I can make it a string type, but with zero padding, it'll sort exactly the same as numbers. I can turn the IPs into integers that I'll show you in a minute on the slide. And a hex representation is basically integers, but as a hex instead of as a decimal, uh, which is also string sorted then. But here's the challenge. What do I pick for a partition key? <clears throat> like, do I do one partition key? I hear that's bad. I hear you're not supposed to do one partition key for your whole table, right? I read the docs. So what do I pick? Half. Half a partition key? Well, like just two, one and two. Think you want to? <laughs> what's half mean? Yeah, I was thinking like maybe you can do the first two groups and then the second two groups. Like mm -hmm. splitting the. This question half. is. Yeah, well, I'll I'll show you a couple of examples. This right here. What do you pick for the partition key? Is what made this one real interesting to me because <clears throat> it's not obvious what the right choice is. And I was curious, how bad would it be if I was wrong? Cody's suggesting maybe slash eight, which is exactly what I was thinking about. So here is an IP address as a string. Uh, so my partition key is zero as a sentinel value. I have just one partition key in this example. And my sort key is the IP address as a string. But the problem is that that does not sort correctly because 10 comes before nine, right? We've all seen that in computers when it's a string. So I would probably need to do something like this. At the end of the day, an IPv4 address is just a 32-bit number. We represent it as these dotted quads because it's easier for us humans than looking at numbers like this. But it's a pretty straightforward transformation to take the, uh, because each of those dotted quads is uh, two, 0 to 255, which is 8 bits. You take the 8 bits of each of those four, you glue it together, and now you've got a 32-bit number. So this is a good sort key. It's a number. It's very efficient, very compact. So probably the right choice for a sort key. Uh, 
Mark's saying you can do the first octet, which is exactly what my next slide does. So now I've got better partition key dispersion, right? I've got 10, 11, 12. What all that I need to do here is make sure that uh, none of my ranges can cross partition key boundaries, right? So I, I wanna make sure that if there is a range that would go from 10 to 11, I need to split it into two now so that half of the range is under my 10 item collection and half of it is under my 11 item collection. And you know this is good. It gives me say 250-ish <clears throat> separate PKs, which is good. It's not great. I was thinking, well, maybe I want to do the first two, like maybe I want to do the slash 16 as my partition key. But then I thought, oh, I don't want to split all the ranges, and this is annoying. And I thought, well, what if I don't? How well can Dynamodb adapt if I don't choose to do that? And so that's why it was kind of fun to explore this, because now what we're going to do is experimentally test what if I don't do what I'm supposed to do. And what happens here? Uh, Richard likes zero padding. It makes debugging easier. Uh, you don't read 167772160 as 10.000 natively? Man. All right, so first we're gonna load these 500,000 items. Oh, Gavin says, is there a disadvantage to storing things as strings versus integers? Uh, insignificant, I mean, we can, on the margins, the string is gonna take a little bit more space than an integer. Um, possibly, probably, microseconds lower to do a sort, but I don't think it mattered too much either. Whatever one you want. This this comes up with times, where do I want to store a time as an ISO date format, you know, year, month, day, or do I want to do it as a number like time since epic? And you can do either one. The strings are human friendly, easy to debug, nice to see in the console. A number is in some ways a little bit slightly more efficient. So I took a CSV file and I loaded, I, I did one partition key, just zero because I wanted to see what happened. And I loaded with a, this was a single threaded client, loading from a CSV of all the 500,000 items. It took six minutes to load and it did like exactly a thousand per second. Why? What's going on? A thousand per second. Uh, Cody says batch size. Uh, good guess, but it's not that. Stefan says one partition key. Yeah, that's what's interesting about it is the partition key. And Dunko says where the numbers ordered, write limits, max RCU for a partition, WCU, says Martin. Yeah, you're in the you're in the right ballpark. The ordering doesn't matter at this point, but I used one partition key. So all of these items were were basically at the start targeting the same partition. And we know that uh, partition on the back end has a 1000 WCU per second maximum. And uh, so what was happening is because everything was going to the same partition at the start, because it's you know zero, that was my partition key. I was being limited right there. I had, a, I created a very hot partition, got the work done, but if you looked, there were a lot of throttles going on here. Hmm, hmm. All right, I know what to do. I was told by, by reading the docs, that I should have multiple partition keys, right? All right, so I will do that. I'll, now I'm gonna switch to the uh, 10, 11, 12 partition keys and I will try again. Huh, I got like 1300. That was not the amazing win I was hoping for. I, uh, I, I have 200 partition keys. Why, why am I limited to like 1300? I have stumped the audience. Some partitions have more data. Danko says, because they were ordered. Martin says, hot partition. Yes, Danko and Martin together have the answer. Because my CSV file was ordered by, right? I mean, that's naturally ordered by, by IP address, right? So I put in 200 partition key values, but all the ones, then all the twos, then all the threes, then all the fours. Huh. So basically I had a rolling hot partition node. Instead of one, I was sending it all the traffic to one and all the traffic to another one. Like if you go to a conference and they have those tables based on last name, so everyone can, you know, in parallel get their badge, but then you've sorted all the attendees before they go into the conference by last name. <laughs> so you go to one table, then everyone goes to the other table and the other tables are just sitting there doing nothing. Now it's a little better because every time you switch tables at this virtual conference, I get a little bit more throughput. Ah, that second I got 2000. But every time uh, you're sending 
much data, more than a thousand during that second, you're going to have another hot table, like a hot uh, partition. So what do I do about it? One option, like I could try to go more than 200, right? Like, all right, well, 200 is not enough. If I do like a lot, like uh, instead of 256, I do 256 squared by doing the slash 16. But still, I mean, that's just like having more tables, but I still sorted all the attendees. And so they're now all still gonna go to one table, another table, another table, another table, another table. I just am switching more often. Ah, Mark says, randomize the insertions. Yes, the easiest approach. I tweak the CSV, I just randomize the order. And look at that, it's all done basically in, uh, what, three minutes? At a rate of about 4,000 for the peak minute. The minute at the front and the back are partial minutes, so that's hard to judge. But basically, I'm getting about 3,600. Why 3,600? Why didn't I get 5,000? I mean, it's way better. This is way better than 1,000 for just randomizing my my data. So now I have high cardinality partition key, randomized data, and I've got a good rate. But why, why, why only 4,000? Why didn't I go to 10,000? Uneven IP distribution, says Steve. Uh, no. This is an on-demand table. An on-demand table, remember, our, our first amuse bouche is created with a certain amount of high water. Uh, it assumes that you have previously done 2,000 writes and you might need to go up to 4,000 writes. And so I have just as much capacity on this new on-demand table as to go up to 4,000 writes until it sees enough traffic for long enough that it decides to increase that. And that's why I'm at 4,000. So there you go. If I were to continue this load, if instead of 500,000, I was gonna do 500 million, it would speed up over time as it would adapt. But this is what you get out of the gate by a default on-demand table. Uh, da, 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 da. All right. So now let's switch from loading to querying. I'm gonna be naughty and I'm gonna use one partition key just to see what happens. Some people like to watch the world burn. How many queries per second should I get if I use one partition key? And let's assume I'm doing eventually consistent reads because this is a good EC workload. We're lined up. Anyone want to throw out, throw out numbers? 500. This is like Price is Right. Yeah, the, the person closest without going over gets the prize. 1,000, keep going, 1,001, oh, perfect. You've seen prices right. Come on, someone do 1,002. <laughs> there you did, 4,000. One dollar, Bob, rats. Uh, no one's got it yet. 999, nope. Some of you are thinking uh, of, of rights. Now, so what do we know about DynamoDB partitions. We know that a DynamoDB partition can do 3,000 RCUs per second, right? A, a query like this should take an RCU because it's a small return value. So therefore I should get 3,000 strongly consistent reads, which implies to me like 6,000. Am I doing this right? Yeah, it feels like I should get about 6,000 eventually consistent reads out of my one partition because I'm all my traffic is just going to one partition if I loaded it all into a single one. So let's see what I get. What? I get 9,000. Boy, all of you underbid. Hmm. 9,000, that was a surprising number. What's going on? I'm getting 4,500 read request units. Basically, I'm in on demand here. 9,000 queries per second. This is over five minutes. Why do I see that? Well, all right, so we have, we know that all the traffic's going to one partition and we know that that one partition can do, uh, if, a, if strongly consistent, 3,000 uh, queries. If eventually consistent, that would be 6,000. And that's somehow I'm getting more than I expect. What, well, that's nice of me. What's really going on? On the back end, we have each partition is replicated to three availability zones, right? And so we do that for durability. So that if one uh, should go down, we have two other copies. They, you don't even see the interruption, really, if you're doing like an eventually consistent read because one goes down, I can read from one of the other two. I've got the data there. And so when you do a strongly consistent read, we read from the leader node. And that's why that one partition on that one node can give you 3,000 read units per second. But if you do eventually consistent, we're allowed to go to any of the three. 
which in a sense triples the throughput, which is why instead of getting 3,000 queries per second, we're getting 9,000 queries per second. Uh, with the one caveat that it is totally within spec that maybe one of those three is down for maintenance, you've still got two, and so you shouldn't assume that you're necessarily going to get the 9,000 queries per second. You might get 6,000, and that's just what you should design for. That's the maximum that's per spec. But hey, if we've got three nodes and they're all up and, and happy at this point in time, you're going to get access to all three of them. And you're going to get uh, 9,000 queries per second, which allows you to actually go above a provisioned amount of 3,000 to get to 4,500. So that's cool. But uh, what happens if I keep going? Anyone want to guess? I'll give you a second to guess. Sawtooth graph. Anyone see this coming? Instead of 4,500 reads, which is 9,000 eventual actual reads, I'm getting 9,000 strongly consistent, which is 18,000. It went up to 18,000. It doubled. After five minutes, the throughput doubled. I like that. That's pretty cool. What happened? Yeah, all right. So Denko says it's got partition on the back end because then would it be on demand adapt, adopted, adapted, adopted, adapted. Yeah, so we, we have this one partition. We actually have four partitions on the back end on this new table, and one of them is getting all the traffic, but we noticed that one is sure pretty hot. These other ones are pretty cold. I should split it in two. And, it, and we did, and therefore now the traffic, because this traffic is well spread across that single partition is now well spread across two partitions. So now I've doubled the throughput. Look at that, 15 minutes later, 18,000. Because now we have two hot partitions, the traffic kept going, each of them split, and now I have four hot partitions. And this continues. So this is why on-demand is really cool, because even if you start, uh, you know, with, without anything special. And even if you're doing one partition key for this, which you should not do, you will still get adaption on the back side, right? Adaptive capacity uh, helping out. That's the thing to Google for if you want to learn more about this. Huh. All right. I like that. So now I let it run for an hour and a half. I think this looks like Yosemite Valley a little bit. I think Half Dome's right there. Where am I getting? Like you see on the left, the startup, this is still the same table. This is still one partition key. And on the left, you see the, the, the come up and then it grows and it grows and it goes really big and then it goes down. Well, all right, let's understand this by starting at the right. It ends at 120,000 because I have set up an 80,000 limit for read units. 80,000 strongly consistent, which means that I will actually be allowed if I'm doing eventually consistent to earn that extra 50%. So basically that's going to limit me to 120,000 consumed. Uh, I'm getting a forgiven a little bit there because of the three partitions that I talked about, the three replicas. Huh, all right. So that's why we're, from now to the end of time, we'll basically be at 120,000 because that's what I've configured as the maximum for this table that I'm willing to basically pay for. Uh, on the left, we see it step up and double 20,000, 40,000 ish, 80,000 ish, you know, 70,000. And so at the left, I'm limited not at the table level, but by how much I have as capacity of partitions on the back end. And the partitions keep splitting. The heat supplied, the partition split. The heat supplied, the partition split. And it grows and it grows and it grows. Now, there's this thing called uh, burst capacity, which is an aspect of this uh, adaptive capacity. And so with this burst capacity, the idea is that if you haven't consumed uh, all, all of the, uh, I'm trying to think of this. if you haven't consumed all of the provisioned capacity that you've allocated, we'll let you go above the provision line for a little bit. And it accumulates. So the longer that you stay below what's been provisioned, the more we'll let you go temporarily above what's been provisioned. And so all the time that we've been below the 80,000 basically provisioned here, we're accumulating this capacity. So once the partitions have split enough to have the table physically able to handle more requests, burst capacity says, all right, we'll let you do it. But after a while, you know, once the table is split so much that we're consuming 225,000 per second, now after that, the burst capacity is saying, all right, that's enough. That's how much I give you. We give you the equivalent of five minutes worth of burst capacity. So if you have provisioned 
a thousand read units, you have enough burst capacity to handle 300,000 above what you've provisioned. That's that's the math there. That's the five minutes worth, which means you could basically go double for five minutes or 50% above for 10 minutes. That's how to think about this ability to go above what you provision. It's a nice feature about DynamoDB that lets you, even if you get the sudden traffic spike, you haven't provisioned to adapt for it, we're still not gonna throttle you right away. We're gonna give you some ability to burst above. And so that's what that 225,000 is there. We're bursting above. We have so much capability now in the table because the partitions have split that we're able to give you a whole lot of capacity. But at some point, the right-hand side of that, we've run out of the burst capacity and now we're gonna put you back at the base level for the table. So that's what we get right here. All right, so I did all that with one partition key. So is there any advantage? Why did the doc say I should have a high cardinality partition key? It looked like that worked out all right for me. Well, maybe I was lucky. Well, here's my hint. And I admit, when I looked at my slides after last year, I look at this and like, I don't even know what I was hinting at. I probably had a good joke in here. I do remember though. Three of them are ice cold. One of them is super hot, right? And so that's what was happening on the back end. If we had these partitions, all the traffic was still going to one because they had that one partition key. And over time, that one camel partition did split and adapt, but I had these three others sitting there uh, ready to roll and they weren't doing anything. And even at the end, they were just sitting there idle, wasted. So here is another on-demand table, but now I have 200 plus partition keys. And look at that, instead of starting out with a 4,500 consumed, it goes straight to 16,000 consumed. And then it goes to 32,000. So now all four of them are being used immediately. And so instead of like starting the race with a very, very slow jog and improving, it's starting off much more of a sprint. And so definitely, if you can do the good design, you use the high cardinality partition key, it's gonna be better for you. There's no, no situation where that's worse. And oftentimes it will help. Even in this case where we were able to adapt to the, the single partition key, you're better out of the gate if you have 200 plus partition keys. And then I thought, all right, can I get a million? Because <laughs> you know, a million is a good number. Hmm. Can I get a million out of this? Could I get a million reads per second out of this? And how long would it take me to get there? Anyone want to guess? The answer is if the speaker says, can I achieve a major thing? The answer is yes, always. <laughs> Stefan says it'll take a while to scale up and repartition. All right, let's 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 test it. So here's my hint, sky's the limit. All right, so what I did here, I provisioned at 500,000 RCUs. So I didn't do an on-demand table this time. I did a 500,000 RCU table. I said, I expect a lot of traffic. 500 thousand RCU should give me a million eventually consistent queries per second, which actually should give me more like a million and a half because of the extra boost, right? So this should get me to 1.5 million roughly. And what I see out of the gate, 240,000 immediately. Nice. All right. So if you tell the, the database, I'm going to be a big table, you do your partition keys at least somewhat with a high cardinality. You get out of the gate pretty good, 240,000. After about uh, 15 minutes, it doubles to 480,000, which tells you I was limited somewhat. Like my traffic wasn't really even. I don't think I had enough cardinality to out of the gate hit the 500,000, but I was pretty good. And the hot partitions were able to split. And when they split, uh, I doubled my throughput. So I stayed at 480,000 for a while for about 15 minutes. And then I started to get a little bit more ability to jump up and eventually enough partitions had split that I was able to no longer be limited by my capacity of the table. And I was only limited from that point forward to the amount of RCUs that I allocated. And I got right near the 1.5 million that I was expecting. Uh, remember, you, you shouldn't plan for it. You, you ask for 500,000 RCUs, you get 500,000 RCUs. Eh, you do eventually consistent, we charge, you know, 500,000 RCUs to give you the million, but you might get a little bit extra. And so there's the 1.44 queries per second. And in 90 minutes, what this took less than an hour for me with this brand new table to be hitting a million queries per second, which, I mean, I've been doing databases a long time, million queries per second is still pretty fun. 
to uh to do it and to do it in your own account without having to provision a darn thing and then you turn it off after was was quite a pleasure and so i i hear that this thing is uh, low latency what do you think the latency was on average for these queries i took a, a moment to step back and look at that so this is the query latency in milliseconds started at 1.72 ended at 1.88 slightly slower by 100 microseconds because of the uh, extra partitions that had to be touched. That's low latency, you know, and DynamoDB low latency at any scale, million queries per second, 1.5 million queries per second almost with a less than two millisecond latency. That was a, that was a very fun test. Uh, let's see, where were the calls coming from? Just curious. I spun up a bunch of EC, EC2 nodes in the same region and just had them uh, on creation bang against the uh, database. All done on a T2 micro. <laughs> How much did the test cost? I didn't look, I didn't want to know. Uh, I did, ironically, I, I used uh, an intern to, to uh, I shouldn't say use an intern. I, I enjoyed my time working with an intern and I said, all right, it's Friday night, make sure you turn off the giant EC2 cluster and then uh, I checked a couple hours later and they left it on. So it was uh, like, oh, turn that off before I get a call of leaving a bunch of EC2 nodes uh, running continuously banging against DynamoDB all weekend. But uh, I would run this for about an hour and a half and then turn it off. It was really great to be so elastic. So the cost wasn't all that bad really because it's just pay for what you use. And that's the last. <clears throat> if you wanna see more about this, Exactly. Search Jay Z Hunter blog. Jay Z Hunter is my username, and this right here uh, is a two-part, actually three-part blog that talks about this and gets into it uh, in some ways, which is kind of fun. So that's something to go for. And otherwise, uh, with one minute left, if anyone has questions, write it into the chat. And I'm happy to do quick answers, but I think thank you all for the participation. It's been a lot of fun to virtually, at least. Uh, interact with you all. Give it one minute. If anyone sort of wants a, a thing that you're confused about or anything, thank you guys. All right. Not seeing a question pop in. So thank you for coming. Hope you had some fun. Hope you learned about DynamoDB uh, in a way that was a challenge. And uh, See you again. I'm going to do a, a version of this talk at, at uh, reInvent again this year. I'm deciding if I do exactly this content or if I create new puzzles for the new year. We'll see. But anyway, talk to you guys later.